Hello, and thank you for watching. My name is Bradford Roberts, principal broker, founder, and owner of TR Realty in the Las Vegas area. After watching this video, please be sure to like it as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel. Download the pertinent handouts for this video by clicking the link in the comments below. Now let's get started. This video is entitled Class 3, Buyer Excellence, and this segment is entitled Buyer Paperwork Before Offer. The reason this segment is entitled Buyer Paperwork Before Offer is because so many agents come to me and have questions about the timing of when they're supposed to be doing their documents. So that's why I've actually, for purposes of this video, divided the paperwork into two segments. This segment is buyer paperwork before offer. So keep in mind all of the following forms that we're about to cover in this segment are forms that I believe should be handled before you ever prepare an offer for the buyer. Now I know it's quite a lengthy list, but I like having my paperwork done. I don't like chasing people later for things. I like being prepared and organized. That's just my style. So we are going to do buyer paperwork before offer. I'd like to uh, mention before we get into these forms that the Nevada Real Estate Division has a five-day requirement. And that five-day requirement is for a licensee to provide the broker with a clear and legible copy of all documents that have been signed by the customer within five calendar days of effectuation. In other words, five calendar days of signature. Electronic delivery is perfectly legal and acceptable as per Nevada law. In fact, here at TR Realty, we don't even accept paper documents. The website that we use uh, to access the vast majority of our forms is called Transaction Desk. And Transaction Desk is part of your Realtor membership. When you sign up, it is provided to you at no additional cost. And Transaction Desk is where you're going to find roughly 100 different forms. I also want to mention, and this is something we'll talk about in my video series, Class 10 Commercial Real Estate, that if you join the Association's Commercial Alliance, you will also have a commercial tab open up in Transaction Desk that will provide you with about three dozen commercial forms as well. Transaction Desk is mobile friendly, so you can use it on your phone or your tablet, and Transaction Desk has 24 seven tech support available to all Realtors at no additional charge. Also included in your Transaction Desk is electronic signature software called AuthentiSign. AuthentiSign, as I mentioned, is free for you, or included, I should say, in your membership. Uh, there's no need for digital ink anymore. There's no need for DocuSign anymore. And one of the cool things about AuthentiSign is it can actually be used for any kind of document. So uh, prior versions of electronic signature allowed us only to send uh, forms through, um, through the electronic signature that were provided by the association. If you work for a company like TR Realty that has their own unique forms that are specific to the company, you would have to do those outside. However, with the new AuthentiSign, that is no longer the case. You can actually upload anything you want such as a TR Realty specific form, and you can send that through AuthentiSign for electronic signature. You can bundle other documents together and send them all together for signatures. And one of the really, really important features of AuthentiSign that I need to point out is that if you set it up correctly, everything that you send is actually date and time stamped to the second. And when it comes to complaints in our industry, there's a good number of complaints that revolve around proving delivery of a particular document. Uh, there's a lot of times when somebody will say, hey, you didn't send this thing to me, or you didn't send it to me until Tuesday when you know you sent it the Friday before. So in order to uh, get away from those types of complaints or to stave off those types of complaints, uh, it's a good idea to use AuthentiSign whenever possible 
do your forms online, set it up for date and time stamp, and that is uh, absolutely holds up in courts here in the state of Nevada. Also, I need to mention that the number of signatures on your paperwork needs to be consistent. We can't have, as an example, a duties owed form, and at the top of the duties owed it says John and Mary Smith, and then we only have Mary Smith sign the form. Or we can't have John Smith on the duties owed, and then we have John and Mary Smith on your offer, okay? The number of signatures must be consistent throughout all of the paperwork. This is a common reason why our compliance department will reject your documents. The number of signatures must be consistent throughout. And sometimes this can change in the middle of the transaction. Sometimes there's a situation where somebody wants to buy a property as an individual and then it's discovered later that they need perhaps a spouse or partner or somebody else to join in that transaction in order to qualify for the mortgage. Or sometimes it goes the other way. And then sometimes real estate agents don't remember, wow, this is now my client as well. I have to go back, I have to get the duties owed, I have to get the residential disclosure guide, I have to get uh, all of the other uh, things in order. So let me say it yet again, the number of signatures must be consistent throughout your paperwork. And remember, the forms that we're covering starting right now are the forms that I recommend you do before you write an offer. So let's get started with the very first form we're gonna be covering in this segment today, which is the duties owed. The official title is duties owed by a Nevada real estate licensee. And there's uh, several things in here that I'd like to point out. Please make sure as you continue this video that you actually have the form in front of you. Otherwise, it's gonna be very difficult for you to follow along. Now, at the top of the form, it says, this form does not constitute a contract for services nor an agreement to pay compensation. A lot of agents don't understand that duties owed is about what we owe to the customer. It is not what the customer owes to us. So a customer could actually go out and sign duties owed with 10 different agents on the same day. This is not a pledge of loyalty in any way. It is not a statement of exclusivity. It has nothing to do with procuring cause. It has nothing to do with commission. This is what we owe the customer, okay? Not the other way around. And then it says on the form, in Nevada, a real estate licensee is required to provide a form setting forth the duties owed by the licensee to, A, each party for whom the licensee is acting as an agent in the real estate transaction. Well, everybody knows that, right? But there's also a B that trips up some agents. It says each unrepresented party to the real estate transaction. So actually in the state of Nevada, once a licensee is involved in a transaction, all parties are required to receive the duties owed form. So if you're in a situation where uh, let's say it's a for sale by owner, a FISBO, or a for rent by owner, a FERBO, and you are the only licensee in the transaction. You are actually required to give duties owed to the other side as well. And in your independent contractor agreement with TR Realty, you're going to see that. Uh, it's also the law. So if you are the only licensee in a transaction, when you turn in your closing checklist to TR Realty, we'll actually be looking for uh, duties owed on both sides. I wanna make sure we're clear on that. Now, when we come to the uh, rectangular box that appears next on the form, it says the licensee in the real estate transaction is, that's where you fill in, uh, you fill in your legal name just like it appears on your license. If your license says your first name is William, you don't wanna put Bill here, you wanna do it exactly as per the license. And then it says whose license number is, that would be your license number. The licensee is acting for, and that's where we put in the names of our clients. And this is where we start to trigger the rule that says the number of signatures needs to be consistent, right? who is or who are the seller, landlord, or buyer, tenant. 
we need to check one of those boxes. And then it says the broker is blank. That's where my name goes. And it's important that you get my name also as it appears on my license. And my legal name is Bradford Roberts. There is no middle name. It's not Brad, it's not Bradley, it's not Robert Redford, okay? It's Bradford Roberts and you have to get it exactly right or your duties owed will be and must be rejected. And then it says whose company is and that's where you would put in TR Realty. Next it says are there additional licensees involved in this transaction, yes or no? For most of you the answer is going to be no, however, the Nevada Real Estate Division a few years ago made a change to this duty zone which allows us to add additional licensees on the same form. What was happening before is those who worked as part of a couple, part of a team, part of a group, they would often go out, meet a client, get the duty zone effectuated, and then they would let other people in their group touch the file, work on the file. And Although duty zone has been required in those cases, most real estate licensees failed to get that duty zone, and of course that would put them in violation of Nevada real estate license law. So if you are in that situation, if there's going to be another Nevada licensee touching your file, then over here you would indicate yes. And as it says here, if yes, supplemental form 525A is required. So take a look at the 525A while we're discussing this. If you look at the top, uh, the licensee, that would be you, is acting for client name, broker is Bradford Roberts, and then you have a, a chance to add additional licensees on this transaction listed below. So you could name several other people here who are part of your group along with their license number, and then this is signed by the principal at the bottom of the form. Now when it comes to TR Realty, we only need you to turn in your 525A as part of your duties owed if in fact there is an additional licensee involved uh, on our side of the transaction. If not, you could forget that 525A. Now the center of the duties owed form goes into all of the things that we know full well, all the things that we learned and we were tested on in real estate school, okay? About reasonable scale, uh, skill and care, um, uh, confidential information, etc., etc. So I'm not gonna spend time on that here, but what I am going to do is draw your attention about 80% of the way down the page where it says licensee acting for both parties. The licensee may or may not, in the future, act for two or more parties who have interests adverse to each other. Okay, this is the section where tons of real estate agents screw up the duties owed. So I wanna make sure that all of my associates clearly know how to do this. And I don't mean to sound uh, flippant here, but whenever you see the word or, you're actually required to make a choice, right? If I offer you an apple or a banana, you're not getting two pieces of fruit, you're not getting no pieces of fruit, you're getting one. So keep that in mind, it says may or may not. These are polar opposites. Either our client is going to allow us to potentially represent both sides, or they're not. And we can't have a situation where, let's say, John Smith initials where it says may and Mary Smith initials where it says may not. Because actually, our client is John and Mary. John and Mary would be one entity. So let me say that differently. Where it says may or may not, you cannot leave it blank. You cannot allow initials in both sides. Everyone who's named at the top of the duty zone in the box must initial may or may not. Can't be both, can't be blank. I hope that's clear. And down the bottom of the duty zone, that's where we have our signature lines. It also includes date and time. Now, if you took my advice earlier in this video and you're using AuthentiSign, then the date and time is gonna be automatic. If you are manually doing this form, make sure 
your customer's date and time. The time is really, really important, especially on a duty zone. So don't overlook that. And that is something that the, the Nevada Real Estate Division is uh, very uh, tight about. They wanna make sure that the form is not only dated, but signed as well. And there's a few other things I want you to know about the duty zone. The duty zone form has only been around since the early 1990s. This is not an old form that's been around 75 years, okay? And actually, when the duties owed form was first created, disseminated, and implemented in uh, Nevada, we were told that we traded the duties owed with another licensee. So example, one licensee representing buyer, one representing seller, they would actually trade the duties owed in the transaction. Not only um, do we not have to do that anymore, but actually we've been uh, recently been given advice by the real estate division not to do it. So we do not give out the duties owed. If you've got another licensee asking you for the duties owed, they probably haven't been to a training class in five years. We don't give out the duties owed to the other agent in the transaction, okay? And I wanna come back because this is so critically important. A couple of minutes ago, I said the duties owed must be dated and timed before any other document in the transaction. It is always, always the very first thing that your customer signs. So I'm gonna give you a little piece of advice here. And that is, when you're using AuthentiSign, Let's say you are going to, to write an offer for someone or you're going to take a listing from someone. What a lot of agents do is they get the duties owed and they get the listing agreement and they get the RDG and all the other forms that they're using and they bundle them up and they ship them out in one email. I'm going to give you a little prophylactic strategy here. What I recommend and what some of the top instructors in Nevada are recommending also is that we do the duties owed in a separate email first. So that way we're not at risk of the customer perhaps signing things out of order. You never know, sometimes customers will turn around and print these forms out. We wanna make sure that we follow the law and we get duties owed first. So my recommendation, we send duties owed first, we send it separate. When that has been dated and timed, now we can turn around and we can transmit the rest of the uh, forms to our customer. Okay, so the very next uh, form that I wanna be discussing with you today is the Residential Disclosure Guide. This is commonly referred to in our industry as the RDG. Um, so please get that in front of you right now so we can go over it. And while you're doing that, I wanna mention that only one is necessary for each customer. If you look at this uh, form from top to bottom, inside out, you'll notice that there's no expiration date on it. You'll notice that it is not specific to any one property. So once we give out this residential disclosure guide, if our customer wanted to turn around and buy seven properties from us, uh, we don't need to repeat this RDG. Now the RDG, uh, depending on the version that you have there in front of you, uh, is either 16 or 32 pages. Very, very lengthy, and I don't wanna spend time on it, but I do wanna point out just a few things. First, if we look at the cover, it talks about the duties owed, it talks about impact fees, soil report, common interest communities, uh, open range, SRPD, and several other topics. So even though we're not gonna spend time on it in this video, I do want to encourage every licensee to read through this thing at least a couple of times. Hey, you're asking your customer to sign it, right? So you need to know what's in it. So read it very, very carefully. Um, I wanna bring your attention to the signature page of this form. Now, when you turn this into TR Realty as part of your closing checklist, the only thing that we need is this signature page. Please do not upload a 32-page uh, document. We're gonna reject that, okay? It just takes up way too much storage. So just go ahead and send us the signature page. You can see there's a place for the date. There's not a place for the time. If you use AuthentiSign, 
that it will be timed automatically. But even though there's not a place, let's get in the habit. And as forms are being updated by the division and by our association, uh, you will see more and more of them have uh, lines for time. But let's get in the habit of adding that even if there's not a specific place for it. So it says the date, let's add the time in there, and then our clients will go ahead and print and sign their names. So that is the residential disclosure guide, the second form that I recommend we do before writing an offer for our, our customer. The third form that I want to talk about right now is commonly referred to as an REO notice. Let's go ahead and get that in front of us right now. The official title at the top of it is, did you know you're buying an REO? Isn't that cute? It rhymes, right? So uh, it's true that this REO notice is only required if the transaction is really an REO property. However, my advice is to always get this signed up front. There's a couple of reasons. One is we might not be intending today to show an REO, but as most of you know, you work with buyers. Sometimes you go out over and over again, could be days, could be weeks, months even. You're pulling new properties that come onto MLS, and it might slip your mind later to get that REO notice. That's one thing. Second thing is from my experience with my years of selling real estate, I believe that we want to get our customer in the habit of uh, signing what we put in front of them. Uh, in other words, we want to give our customer as much information as we possibly can, and we want to be acknowledged for providing that information. Acknowledgement is the signature. So even though it's only a small chance uh, that they're going to buy an REO in today's market, and even though this form is only required if, in fact, it's a real estate owned property, a bank owned property, I still recommend you get this form signed up front. And if we take a look at the form, uh, it goes on to talk about what is an REO. Of course, it says REO means real estate owned, and that is what banks call their inventory. And the vast majority of REO properties are properties that the lender foreclosed. There are some other ways that banks can acquire properties, but when we think of REO, pretty much we're thinking of foreclosure properties. The form asks, is an REO a better deal than other properties on the market? What kind of financing is available? What happens when I write my offer, etc.? So go ahead and give this a read. Feel free to pause this video right now and read through it or read through it later at your uh, convenience. But I want to bring your attention to the signature page, which is page two, where the buyer signs, dates, and this one does actually have a place for the time. Okay, so uh, that is the REO notice. Oh, oh, one other thing before I leave this one. I also want to mention to you that this form is going to be required on a HUD home. And we're going to be talking later in this class three about HUD homes. Uh, but I just want to mention for now that if your buyer is buying a HUD home, HUD will require, did you know you're buying an REO? Okay. So uh, that is that. Oh, and you know what? There's one other thing that comes to mind right now while we're talking about REOs that I want to share with you. And that is if you would like to improve your chances of acceptance when you write an offer on an REO property, I recommend that you try to set the closing date at the end of any given month. Now, for us, uh, January 31st and February 1st are only one day apart. However, for a bank, the difference between January 31st and February 1st is a month because banks have monthly reporting requirements and banks want to get that inventory off their books. I know that when the market crashed around 12 years ago or so, a lot of people um, perpetuated the myth that Banks are sitting on properties, they're holding back re from releasing properties. No, banks do not want to hold on to properties, okay? That's not the business they're in. They have huge carrying costs from taxes to insurance to association fees to maintenance. 
uh, to landscaping, they're at a very high risk of having those kinds of properties broken into, which are going to cost them more headaches and more money. Banks don't want to hold on to properties. And we're going to get into that a whole lot more in my video series, Class 6, which is predominantly about short sales. Um, but just to circle back and finish my point, REOs are best offered with a closing date at the end of the month. I've seen cases where lenders will take a lower offer if you could close by the end of the month compared to a little higher offer that spills over into the next calendar month. So just a strategy for you to keep in mind. All right, the next form that we're going to be talking about right now is before you purchase property in a common interest community. So let's go ahead and get that one in front of us. Uh, we do refer to this as before you purchase, just a shortened uh, variation of the name. Now, if you'll notice this one, take a look at the signature page. There is no property address. There is no expiration date on this which should tell you that it's only one per customer. So once you give this out, uh, you're good to go there, all right? So again, the title is Before You Purchase Property in a Common Interest Community. To refresh your memory, when we talk about a common interest community, a CIC, they take three forms in Nevada. One is a homeowners association, one is a condo association, and the third is a cooperative association. So we use the term CIC as a blanket term to encompass all of those things, okay? And Nevada law is very strict and very tight when it comes to common interest communities, starting with the fact that if you have a customer who's about to purchase in a common interest community, it is absolutely mandatory that we provide this form and we get it signed by the customer. Paragraph one of this form talks about the five calendar day statutory right of cancellation. Let's break that down a little bit. So first of all, starting with five calendar days, if you'll notice here, it doesn't say calendar days. That's because if you're ever looking at any kind of form that says three days for this or 10 days for that or what have you, if it doesn't specify business days, it's automatically calendar days. And keep in mind that calendar days would include weekends, would include holidays as well, okay? Whether you're working or you're not working, calendar days are always ticking. So it says you have five days, of course meaning calendar days, to cancel. And I also mentioned this is statutory. The word statutory tells you it's part of the law. In other words, this is not something that can be negotiated in a contract. It is five statutory calendar days that the buyer would have to cancel. And that right of cancellation, a clock, starts when the buyer actually receives his resale package. Now we'll be talking about uh, that um, a little bit later in, in some more detail. But for the purpose of this notice, just understand that um, that buyer is always going to have, can't be waived, can't be compromised, can't be negotiated, that five calendar day right of cancellation. It goes on to talk about restrictions in a CIC property, paying your assessments. When we talk about assessments, that's really the correct way of saying monthly payments. You know, not every association charges monthly, some charge quarterly, some even charge annually, by the way although the vast majority do charge monthly. So we tend to call them, you know, monthly, monthly payment, whatever, but the proper word is to call those assessments. And you'll need to keep that in mind because when we get into the purchase and sale agreement in my video series five, you're, you're going to see uh, lots of talk, uh, lots of language in the contract about assessments, and I want you to know exactly what that means. So this form goes on to talk about what can happen if you don't pay your assessments, uh, you're uh, required to receive that resale package, you have rights, etc. I want to bring your attention to paragraph 8. If you look at paragraph 8, about five lines down or so, it mentions the office of the ombudsman. And I just want to bring your attention to that because a lot of times customers ask, 
hey, who do I talk to? I don't think my association's doing the right thing or, or maybe they're, you know, I think they're misappropriating funds or there's a dispute or there's a problem with voting or whatever. I don't know where to go, who to talk to. The answer is the office of the ombudsman. And the office of the ombudsman is part of the Nevada Real Estate Division. They're located on a floor in the building that most of you never go to, but they're actually located in the same building as licensure. And that is where we would direct any kind of complaint regarding a common interest uh, community. And um, just a couple of thoughts before we leave this topic, you know, common interest communities are loved or hated. It uh, totally depends um, on the individual. Some people believe that common interest communities help keep things symmetrical and clean and orderly in a community. Other people think, uh, hey, you know, a common interest community is like being part of a, uh, an authoritarian uh, regime, for God's sake. They tell me what color I can paint my house, uh, what kind of plants I can have in my front yard, all kinds of things. So it's really up to the individual whether they like a common interest community living or not. Um, and there are some crazy, crazy rules out there that as a real estate agent, uh, you might encounter at some point. Uh, did you know there are some common interest communities that do not allow you to back into your driveway? Uh, that if your car is facing the wrong way, it's actually a finable um, offense. Uh, that might be hard to believe. Did you know that there are some common interest communities that don't allow you to smoke outside? Outside. You couldn't even smoke, let's say, in your front yard while you're cutting the grass or whatever you're doing out there. Um, and this one uh, that I wanna share with you is probably the craziest one I've ever heard in my 25 year career. And I'll tell you, if I were an attorney, I would love to challenge this one because I can't believe this is actually a rule. But there are some communities that require you leave the gar garage door open during the daytime. Now that is insanity, right? If you think of the security risk, that could be in some places. And if you're curious, why the heck would the community want me to leave my garage door open during the day? It's because some people will use their garage improperly as a place to live. Some people convert the garage to a bedroom or uh, that sort of thing. So the associations in their infinite wisdom to stave off that kind of conduct, they would require the garage door to be open during the day. Now, I'm not sure what you do if you go to work and the house is vacant. Uh, nonetheless, that is, uh, that is a rule in some communities. The next form that I want to cover here is the buyer's notice of disclosure. Uh, please go ahead and get that in front of you. This is a relatively new form and at TR Realty, we have made a decision to make this mandatory. As we go through this and look at some of the provisions, you'll probably be able to figure out why I have decided to mandate this form. So again, it is called Buyer's Notice of Disclosure, not to be confused with the buyer's disclosure that we're gonna be talking about in a little while. So assuming you have that in front of you, uh, let us continue. This notice is designed to inform a buyer of general property conditions and other related matters that often arise during the purchase of real property in Southern Nevada. Buyer is encouraged to seek out additional information from qualified licensed professionals should additional information or questions arise. And that's where we fill in the names of the buyers. And then we've got these paragraphs, which are, in my opinion, really excellent disclosures. And they act as prophylactics or layers of protection for the associate and also for the broker. Now let's take a look where it says pest notice. The buyers of property in Southern Nevada are hereby put on notice that various pests, rodents, and insect species exist in Southern Nevada. And the uh, goes on to talk about some of the types of pests, but uh, I want to bring your attention to the second paragraph where it says, buyers are encouraged to obtain a pet inspection, pest inspection, excuse me. So that's really important 
because it is a common complaint. Uh, someone will buy a property in southern Nevada and in a couple of weeks after that contact their real estate agent and say, hey, you never told me that there are scorpions in my home. Well, actually, since we build property to the edges of the mountains and out in the desert, we're in the scorpions' home. The scorpions aren't in our home, right? But uh, I digress. So uh, to prevent us from having any kind of problems, any kind of unhappy customer, here we put in writing that the buyers are encouraged to get a pest inspection. The next paragraph here is about soil and geological conditions. The following one is about mold notice. And I want to bring your attention to something interesting in this paragraph. Uh, this section, I should say, paragraph number two, where it says, in capital letters, buyer's duty to inspect. Buyer hereby assumes responsibility to conduct whatever inspections buyer deems necessary to inspect the property for mold contamination. So again, we don't ever want a buyer coming back and saying, hey, my real estate agent uh, didn't encourage me to get an inspection. I didn't even know I could get an inspection. So that's why this uh, form exists. Uh, the next one down is flood hazard zone. Most of you probably know that if your property is located in a flood zone, you probably want to have flood insurance. Most of you also probably know that flood insurance is typically not part of a homeowner's insurance policy. It is typically something that you have to buy separately. So it says here, buyer is advised a property may be located in a designated flood zone. So this is something that the buyer needs to investigate on their own. Then we move on to talk about radon gas. And if you drop about five lines down into the paragraph on radon gas, it says broker and agent recommend that the buyer at his or her sole expense conduct his or, own, his or her own investigations. Same concept. And you see the, the common denominator in what I'm pointing out here in this form is the protection for us as licensees. So people can come back and say, hey, uh, my agent didn't tell me, I didn't know, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it goes on to talk about zoning, same thing. Second to last line in that paragraph. It says, call the zoning and planning department. It goes on to talk about airport noise, where it says, buyer assumes full responsibility to investigate the proximity of airports. And golf courses and solar panels, uh, something in solar panels I want to bring your attention, where it says, if a property has solar panels, additional information will be required from the seller regarding how the panels may be transferred to the buyer. Sometimes uh, trying to do the right thing, of course we're green certified and we're all about solar panels, but some people can enter either into a lease agreement or a purchase agreement for solar panels that actually becomes a deed restriction and survives the conveyance of the property, meaning the new buyer is going to inherit uh, either the lease payments or the finance payments for those solar panels. So this is something that we need to be conscious of. And by the way, uh, parenthetically, I wanna mention, agents ask me sometimes, uh, how would I know about solar panels uh, and the next one we're about to talk about conservation easement. Well, the seller is supposed to disclose it, but in any case, these are things that will pop up in the PTR, the preliminary title report. If you uh, are not sure what a preliminary title report is or how it's used or when it's produced in real estate, please be sure to go back and watch my video series, class two, where I do cover that. And the next paragraph here, as I mentioned, is the conservation easement. Certain properties may be subject to conservation easements, such as the Southern Nevada Water Authority. So a lot of people don't understand that when you take money from the SNWA to remove water features like grass on your property, and you replace that with desert-friendly landscaping, which of course is a good thing, right? We wanna save water. But what a lot of people don't realize is that becomes a deed restriction that lasts 30 years. For the next 30 years, if any subsequent owner wanted to put those water features back on their property, they may be subject to repaying the money that the other owner, the seller, 
got for replacing those water features in the first place. Yes, you could be held liable for repaying money that you never got. So that is something that we need to be conscious of. Uh, then it goes on to talk about uh, home security systems and video surveillance, where interestingly in that paragraph it says, buyers should assume that they are under surveillance while touring a home. Yeah, that's something that we're going to talk about later today, how more and more homes have video and even audio equipment. It's perfectly legal inside of someone's home. They don't need to, to warn anybody about it. They don't need to disclose it in any way. Uh, they have every right to record what goes on in their own home. So buyers and agents should not be having confidential conversation inside someone else's property. Uh, here's another interesting one. Smart homes. It says some homes may contain smart home technology. So more and more homes, of course, have te technological features like uh, smart panels and ways to control the temperature remotely and turn on and off the AC and those kinds of things. But how many agents actually think about getting the passwords for those things before the closing? Uh, this could even happen with something like a WAP, a wireless access point. So let's say you buy a home and you, you like the wireless access point, so you like the smart panel in the property, and you think you're going to move in and start using that. Well, you probably need the passwords to that. How many agents are actually putting that in their offers today? Something that I highly recommend. And then it goes on to talk about gaming, proximity to casinos, and there's a very, very important section that comes up next where it says receipt of for your protection notice. Look at the title, receipt of for your protection notice. TR Realty has recently taken the for your protection notice and made it a required document. The reason we've made it required is because this new notice of disclosure says that the buyer has already gotten it. That's why this paragraph is entitled receipt of for your protection. And in this paragraph, it says buyer has carefully read the attached. It's attached for your protection. Get a home inspection notice. OK, so that is why, again, we have mandated that. And in this paragraph, we do have to make a choice. The buyer needs to initial where it says buyer chooses to have a home inspection performed, buyer chooses not to have a home inspection performed. Like any other place we see the word or, we can't leave it blank, we can't choose both, the buyer has to make a choice. And folks, even though it doesn't specifically say so, I love initials. I don't like check marks or X's. I really love initials because that will go a long way toward proving that the agent didn't just, you know, put a check mark there. The, the buyer actually initialed on his or her own. So I highly recommend whenever you see a place where you'd be tempted to put a check mark or an X that we actually go ahead and get initials on that. And then there's a section for home warranty. It says it is recommended that buyers secure a home warranty. And once again, we have that or question. Um, buyer chooses to purchase a home warranty or buyer waives the home warranty coverage. We definitely need a choice there. And of course, don't forget the initials down the bottom of every page. And on the last page of this buyer's notice of disclosure form, uh, there is a section on probate. Uh, three lines down, it says buyers of such properties are advised to speak to an attorney. Yeah, probate can be complicated. We can absolutely sell properties that are in probate, no problem, but they can be time consuming. Uh, I've seen probate cleared up in a few weeks. I've also seen it take a year. Are the parties willing to stay in the contract for that long until probate is clear? So this is a disclosure letting the buyer know that if you write an offer on a property that's in probate, um, you better talk to an attorney because it's going to be subject to court approval. And then there's a paragraph on rental restrictions. It says some homeowners associations include rental restrictions in their CCNRs. Uh, that is true. Not every property out there can be rented. 
Not every property out there can be rented from day one. There are other kinds of restrictions. If you continue to read this paragraph, it goes on to talk about short-term rentals, how many municipalities actually prohibit short-term rentals, which is 30 days or less. There are some communities that will only allow you to have one tenant per year. And let's say you put a tenant in the property and after two months you have to evict them for some reason, you are out of luck until a whole year passes. There are also some other communities around Las Vegas that will set a cap at the percentage of properties that can be rented out at any one given time and there could be a waiting list uh, to rent out your property. So uh, rental restrictions uh, are uh, fairly common in the Las Vegas area and if you've got someone intending to buy a property as an investment and rent it out, they should definitely be communicating with the association to see what the restrictions could be. And then the final paragraph in this form talks about hold harmless. Um, the second line is very important where it says, hereby agrees to hold broker and agents in this transaction harmless. That is a great way to be held in my opinion. Uh, then we have uh, lines for the buyer to sign and date. Unfortunately, uh, there's no time on this. I think it was an oversight by our association. Uh, I hear that the, um, the next version of this will have a time, but always get in the habit of having your customers time it and don't forget the very, less, very last set of initials all the way down the bottom of page four. Now, covering this form, we talked about the uh, receipt of for your protection. And I said that TR Realty has now mandated that form because it says in the buyer's notice of disclosure, hey, this is a receipt, it's attached, so we have to use it. So that is the form that I wanna cover next. Please get the next handout in front of you, which is the receipt of for your protection notice. The first page of this is the actual notice itself. It says, for your protection, get a home inspection. And there's nothing for us to do on this page other than provide it to a prospective buyer. It talks about why it is in the buyer's best interest to get a home inspection. It is the second page that we care about, which is the receipt of that notice, receipt of for your protection, where the property address goes at the top, buyer's name, and then it says, I understand the importance of getting an independent home inspection. I considered this before signing a contract with the seller for a home. Furthermore, I've carefully read the attached for your protection, get a home inspection notice, which we just talked about, and fully understand uh, that FHA will not perform a home inspection or guarantee the price or condition of the property. And then once again, I choose to have a home inspection perform. I choose not to have a home inspection perform, sign date, and please go ahead and add that time in there as well. I wanna circle back before I move on. We were talking about the uh, buyer's notice of disclosure and the Southern Nevada Water Authority, the fact that if you take money, it can put a deed restriction on your property for 30 years. And I also said some buyers or subsequent owners to that property might choose to put those water features back knowing full well they have to pay back the money that the previous owner took for the property. I just wanna um, circle back and mention, even in the case where someone might be okay to pay that money back, they really, really want some grass or some water features on their property, keep in mind that in more and more cases in Southern Nevada, either the city, the county, or the common interest community might prohibit it. Even if the Southern Nevada Water Authority says, yes, you can pay back the money and uh, put back those water features, the city, county, or association might not allow it. All right, let us move on and talk about a form that is specific to TR Realty. And that's why it is entitled TR Realty Buyer's Disclosure. As I mentioned earlier, don't confuse the TR Realty Buyer's Disclosure with the Buyer's Notice of Disclosure, which is provided by our association. Actually, both of these forms are 
mandatory. Please go ahead and get that in front of you. Feel free to pause the video right now if you need to do so. Okay, so the TR Realty Buyer's Disclosure says, this document shall serve as a list of important disclosures to you, our customer. However, this is not intended to be inclusive or exhaustive. TR Realty believes these disclosures are important while making a decision to purchase real estate. This document does not obligate you in any way. Rather, TR Realty believes you have the right to be informed. And folks, make no mistake, this document is all about protection. This document has been put together over many, many years, thousands of transactions, in an attempt to address virtually every possible complaint or problem that could come back to bite you as a licensee. So keep that in mind as we go through it. Starting with paragraph number one, which is the right to legal counsel. You always have the right to consult with an attorney of your own choosing and at your own expense. So remember that anyone has the right to consult with an attorney at any time, before, during, or after the transaction. There's nothing we can say or should say to ever dissuade anyone or to try to stymie that legal right that they have in any way. So we don't want someone to say in a courtroom or in front of the real estate division, hey, my agent told me I have, the no, I have no right to talk to an attorney. So that's why we have this in writing, explaining they absolutely have that right. Paragraph two is the statute of frauds. Uh, you might remember from real estate school, statute of frauds says even though co uh, verbal contracts are legal in Nevada, they're not enforceable. So statute of fraud says it must be in writing to be enforceable. Paragraph three talks about effective contracts. Sellers are under no obligation, legal or otherwise, to entertain offers in the order in which they are received. Sellers control what, if anything, they decide to do when presented with an offer from a buyer, and they may opt to hold your offer, possibly along with others, until such time as they're ready to make a decision. And the reason we have this paragraph is because there's a broad misunderstanding of what a contract truly is or what constitutes a legally binding contract. I like to use the word effective. I'm fully aware that a lot of people like to say executed. In my non-attorney opinion, an executed contract is one that has been completed. So in other words, if we have a purchase and sale agreement and we have recorded the deed, the buyer now has legal possession of the property, now we have an executed contract. An effective contract, however, is one that has been signed by the parties and delivered to the parties. In the case of a purchase and sale agreement, the parties would be a buyer and a seller. In the case of a listing agreement, the parties would be the broker and the seller. In the case of a buyer brokerage agreement, the parties would be the buyer and the broker. In the case of a property management agreement, the parties would be the broker and the property owner, right? So the, for us to have an effective contract, the relevant parties must sign, but they also have to meet proof of delivery. If I just sign a contract and I leave it on my kitchen table and I don't convey it to the other side, we do not have a legally binding contract. We do not have, as I like to call it, an effective contract. Paragraph four talks about uh, the fees and costs associated with a real estate transaction, the fact that they might not be refundable and TR Realty is not responsible for those costs. So as an example, if somebody orders a home inspection, they pay for it, and then they decide to back out of the deal, they can't look to us for reimbursement for the cost of that inspection, right? Of course. Paragraph five talks about fair housing and how strict and diligent TR Realty is when it comes to following all the fair housing laws and amendments that have been created over the years. Uh, I am absolutely adamant about TR Realty uh, following all fair housing laws and amendments. And folks, even if these weren't laws, these would be the right things to do anyway. 
So at this company, I do not, will not tolerate any kind of discrimination in any way. I want to be absolutely crystal clear about that. Paragraph six goes on to talk about our relationship disclosure. Relationship disclosure, disclosure is a generic term and the actual state, uh, such as Nevada, uh, has, to, has to provide some sort of written relationship disclosure. Here in Nevada, we refer to that as a duties owed. In other states, it has different names. But if, if anyone ever uh, asks you for a copy of your relationship disclosure, just keep in mind that here in Nevada, we, we call that a duties owed. Paragraph seven is a vendor disclosure. Uh, which states that even if your TR Realty associate recommends that you contact a particular vendor, we are not responsible. You always have uh, the freedom of choice. You can use one of the vendors we recommend, or you're always free to go out there and get someone on your own. Paragraph eight talks about fraud. So th those of you who are smart enough to have watched video series class one, you know we talked about fraud. Uh, how Nevada has the fourth highest rate of fraud in the United States. That's why we have a couple of paragraphs in here to address this. And we don't want an associate uh, to have any involvement in any kind of fraudulent activity, even inadvertently. Uh, sometimes uh, just the forwarding of an email to your customer uh, could be enough to uh, have someone accuse you of fraud. Uh, things like maybe fraudulent wire instructions that seem to come from a title company when they really don't, etc. So paragraph eight here in the TR Realty Buyer's Disclosure is really important, and that's why it has two separate sets of initials in there. The paragraph nine is the mortgage broker disclosure. Uh, if uh, any of my associates are licensed to broker mortgages in Nevada, uh, they are required to uh, initial where it says is a licensed mortgage broker in the state of Nevada. Now, we don't have a prohibition if someone wants to uh, use your uh, mortgage broker services as well as your real estate services. They are welcome to do that. Uh, however, we cannot force them. We cannot coerce them in any way to do that. We want to make sure they're aware of that and that's what paragraph 9 is about. A paragraph 10 talks about the SRPD, the seller's real property disclosure. Obviously, uh, virtually everyone watching this video knows that Nevada law requires any seller of residential property to disclose any known material defects. That must be done in writing, and the form that we use to do that is known as that SRPD. Paragraph 11 is an encouragement uh, to the buyer to go ahead and do a home inspection. And even in the case of new construction, we highly recommend the buyer get an inspection by hiring the inspector of their choosing. Now, I do wanna mention that there are some uh, builders that very recently in Southern Nevada have decided to ban buyers from doing a home inspection. You're gonna hear me say when we talk about new construction later in class three, how if you um, are considering buying a home from a builder that doesn't allow you to do an inspection, run like hell, go find another builder because that is ridiculous. The builder should have pride in their product. They should not prohibit a buyer from doing an inspection get the hell away from that builder, go find a legitimate builder who's concerned about protecting the buyer's rights and allows that buyer to do an inspection. Paragraph 12 talks about hazardous substances. Of course, when it comes to real estate, there are many potentially hazardous substances, including asbestos, radon gas, lead-based paint, lawn chemicals, and you can read here uh, the entire list that we've prepared. But we recommend that the buyer investigate the potential for any of these hazardous substances. And speaking of hazardous substances, in paragraph 13, we have singled out mold because it is probably the most common hazardous substance that we deal with in real estate in this area. 
We want to make sure that the public knows that we are not trained uh, in mold. We cannot make a determination what kinds of mold are harmful versus harmless. They need to get an inspection. Uh, paragraph 14 talks about inclusions and exclusions, referring to uh, real property and personal property in a transaction. So we want to make sure that if the buyer is expecting, um, let's say, a chandelier or an above ground pool or some mirrors that might be hanging on the wall, uh, we want to make sure that those are included in the transaction. So what we're saying here is that the parties will rely only on what is contained in the residential purchase agreement. What is in MLS is not legally binding. Did you get that? What is in MLS is not legally binding. The parties, buyer and seller, do not share information in MLS. It's not a contract. That is an agent who put that information in there who is not a party to the contract. So the only thing that matters when it comes to what stays and what is being removed in a real estate transaction is what is contained in that residential purchase agreement. Paragraph 15 talks about renovations, additions, and pools. Um, basically, if you want to renovate your property or add to your property or build a pool, you need to go to the community. You need to go to the city or the county and find out what you can do. Don't rely on the real estate agent. 16 is the conservation easement, which we were talking about a little earlier in this video. Uh, paragraph 16 contains the website where someone can go and get more information on the uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority uh, conservation easement, uh, but definitely this is something that we need to be mindful of in our market. 17 is a recommendation to the buyer to get a home warranty. Property, uh, property tax disclosure is paragraph 18. There's a website where someone can go and get information on property taxes. The current property taxes may or may not be indicative of what the next buyer, the next owner is going to pay for their taxes. Paragraph 19 talks about school districts. As many of you know, school districts often change in Southern Nevada. Uh, that's because of population growth. And there's a website here contained in paragraph 19 where the buyer should go and check the um, school district. We should not be uh, stating or certainly we should not be promising in any way what school the children of the buyers would go to if they purchased that property. That's a very important issue to some people, fraught with liability for real estate agents. So let the buyer visit the website, plug in the address, and ascertain the schools on their own. The same exact thing is true with paragraph 20, which is sex offenders. If somebody wants to know if there's sex offenders living in the neighborhood, here's the website where they go and they check that out on our own. That is not for us to impart. 21 talks about common interest communities. And folks, I know some of this is a little redundant from the buyer's notice of disclosure. Good. There's nothing wrong with repeating yourself, right, to get your point across. So paragraph 21 talks about common interest communities, how the buyer is entitled to a resale package, and um, they, the buyer always needs to read and understand what's contained in that resale package, uh, especially in terms of how much they're going to pay and any restrictions on their property. Paragraph 22 talks about age-qualified communities. Uh, we did talk about that in uh, class three thus far. Um, age-qualified is what we used to call age-restricted. And again, there's a lot of liability here for a real estate licensee who attempts to inform a buyer, yes, you meet the qualifications, or no, you don't meet the qualifications. Families are complex today. And in addition to the age qualification certification that a community might possess, the CCNRs of the community could impose actually more restrictions than that. So we as real estate agents cannot get involved in that. We need to be sure that our, our prospective buyers contact the association directly, 
describe who, what, who, and the circumstances uh, of of who will be living in that property. I should say the circumstances of that, and make their own determination if this is a viable property for them. The same is true for rentals, which is paragraph 23, that TR Realty and the associates are not going to be responsible for any kind of rental restrictions that may be imposed by the association. Same is true for paragraph 24 about pets. Uh, we are not going to be responsible for pet related issues. If someone is going to buy a property and they have a pet or they intend to get a pet, they need to contact the association directly and discuss that with them. And always keep in mind that service animals and emotional support animals are not pets. And therefore, they would not be subject to any kind of pet restrictions uh, of any kind. And paragraph 25 talks about closing costs. So folks, this is a very important paragraph for us. If you were smart enough to watch video series class one, I actually did a segment in that class where we talked about processing fees. The fact that virtually every company has a processing fee, TR Realty has a processing fee. And what we are going to collect as a processing fee on a residential transaction is going to be $299. On a commercial transaction, it's going to be $399. That's what we are going to collect. However, as an associate in this company, we do provide you with the flexibility to increase or decrease or even waive that fee as you wish. Uh, you might have a situation where someone has bought and sold several properties from you over the years and you feel inclined to pay the processing fee for them. So as I said, we are going to collect $299 residential or $399 commercial. If you charge your customer a higher processing fee than that, perhaps there are circumstances why you've chosen to do that. That extra amount is going to be added to the commission and that will be given to you. And on the other side of that coin, if you decide to charge less or nothing for a processing fee, it will be uh, deducted from the commission accordingly. But as you can clearly see in paragraph 25, you have the flexibility to, to add that processing fee in there, as well as have your buyer's initial. And that way, there's no surprise later. Uh, we're not just uh, uh, hitting them blindsided with a processing fee at the time of closing. It's a fee that they've agreed to and they're aware of upfront in the transaction. And then you come to the end of this TR Realty buyer's disclosure, where it says you hereby acknowledge your TR Realty associate has explained these disclosures to you. Should you want additional assistance understanding any part of this disclosure, please ask your TR Realty associate or seek assistance from an independent source. Your signature below indicates that you have read and understand this document and you acknowledge receipt of it. Please keep a copy of this disclosure for your records. Sign, date, time, don't forget the initials all the way down the bottom of every single page. Again, I repeat that this is mandatory. It's gonna be part of your closing checklist. Remember the segment that we are in right now. Buyer paperwork before offer. If you follow what I'm training right now, as well as what is on our closing checklist on our website, you will not have to scramble later and go back and try to get these forms signed. So very important that you take my advice here and you do the forms I suggest you do at the time I suggest you do them. All right, so next I'd like to bring your attention to the coronavirus addendum or amendment. Yes, folks, that is the title that our association came up with, coronavirus addendum or amendment. Please get that handout in front of you now. All right, so looking at this form, uh, obviously by the title, you can tell that this form has not been around very long. It says the following terms and conditions are hereby incorporated in and made a part of as applicable uh, or an amendment to the purchase agreement or something else. We fill in the date, we fill in the property address uh, in which blank is referred to as buyer and blank is referred to as seller. So we're going to put our party's names 
in there as well. It says, from time to time, events overtake the ability of the parties to a contract to allocate the risk of non-performance. Such events are often addressed by a force majeure clause, allowing a party to suspend or terminate performance when circumstances which the parties could not have anticipated or which are beyond their control make performance of the contract impossible or impracticable. And when I sold real estate in Florida, we had a force majeure clause and that clause was used a lot when hurricanes would come through. We would have properties in escrow and all of a sudden the trees would fall down, the fence would be gone, the, the, uh, the pool would be uh, splintered, there'd be a hole in the roof and you know the buyer didn't want to buy the house anymore. So buyers used to cancel because of the force majeure. Nevada doesn't really have a lot of natural disasters uh, yet, <laughs> I should say, uh, but now we do have this coronavirus, which of course is not specific to Nevada, but this is one of the things that we are forced to deal with, and that's why they're referring to this as force majeure. It goes on to say the current worldwide coronavirus pandemic has had unprecedented impacts on real estate transactions, including, but not limited to, travel restrictions, self-imposed and governmentally required isolations, and closures of both governmental and private offices required to fund, close, and record real estate transactions. Accordingly, in the event complying with the close of escrow is not possible, or practical as a result of unforeseen circumstances related to the COVID-19, such as buyers or sellers inability to travel to sign documents, closings of or delays in related government and business services, including for example, delays by or closings of lenders, title and escrow, county assessor, recorder, or otherwise here in unforeseen circumstances, the parties agree as follows. All other provisions of the agreement remain in full force and effect. So we've got four options here. Uh, the first one says buyer and seller agree to postpone close of escrow by up to 30 or some other number of days that you can write in to accommodate unforeseen circumstances. After which either party, either party may cancel the agreement and buyer's deposit shall be returned to buyer. So paragraph one is a paragraph that we would use if the parties simply need a little more time to perform on this contract. Number two says, if checked, buyer and seller agree that if buyer is unable to fund their loan due to buyer's loss of income from COVID-19 related issues, then either party may cancel the agreement and buyer's deposit shall be returned to buyer. So uh, as you probably know, unemployment right now is the highest it's ever been in Nevada history. As of the filming of this video, we are at a 33% unemployment rate. Um, so basically every family is being affected by the unemployment situation. Unemployment, of course, has a direct correlation to uh, the ability to obtain a mortgage, and that's what paragraph two is all about. If someone has lost their income because of the coronavirus, the buyer can get their EMD returned. Paragraph number three says buyer and seller agree to mutually cancel the agreement and buyer's deposit shall be returned to buyer. So paragraph three gives us kind of a blanket opportunity no matter who initiated, no matter what the circumstances are, if the parties just think this is not the time to transact this property uh, by mutual consent, we can check number three, go ahead, close out the transaction uh, by returning the EMD to the buyer and canceling the contract. And paragraph four, as you can see, it just says other, uh, it's blank. Uh, I'm not sure what other case we could write in there because Paragraph number three is, uh, uh, you know, pretty uh, is 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 a pretty much a blanket cancellation provision. But nonetheless, the association has given us another opportunity to come up with something creative. And down near the bottom, you'll see that the buyers and sellers need to sign. They need to date. I highly recommend that they time this as well. Now, I want to go back to the title of this form because. If you remember, it's the coronavirus addendum or amendment. 
So the reason they're naming it that awkward way is because this could be used up front as part of your offer. It can be amended, I'm sorry, addended to the contract, meaning that if you have a foresight right up front and you think something might happen because of the virus or the um, consequent unemployment situation, we can go ahead and we can use this as an addendum to the contract or amendment. So technically, once we have a contract, we don't really have an addendum anymore, even though we use that parlance every day in real estate, we technically have an amendment to that contract. So calling it a coronavirus addendum or amendment allows it to be used as part of your offer process or as a document that could be added into the transaction later on. All right, so that is the coronavirus uh, form that I wanted to cover. The next thing I want to talk about is writing an offer on a property that the buyer has not seen. Wow, how fortuitous to have this topic next right after the coronavirus addendum because in today's day and age, uh, as we film this video specifically, we cannot show a property that is occupied by a tenant. And even if we could show a property occupied by, occupied by a tenant, there are many cases where buyers and or sellers are just not comfortable. Buyers don't want to uh, go into uh, a stranger's home and, and touch all the surfaces, not having any confidence that that home has been cleaned properly, or sellers simply don't want strangers in their home. So right now, we have the highest percentage of properties being sold, or rented for that matter, without the buyer or tenant seeing the property that I've ever had or experienced in my career. It's very risky. And actually, there's a very high cancellation rate of effectuating a contract for a buyer who has not seen the property. And over the years, I've always said there's only a couple of excuses. One is tenant occupied. Boy, how germane that is today. Or a situation where the buyer is out of the area for whatever reason. Other than that, we should always encourage the buyer to go see the property. Yes, well today, we have the coronavirus situation where a lot of buyers and sellers don't want that actual in-person viewing to happen. And we never want to draft an offer and create any kind of language like, you know, this offer is contingent upon interior viewing or something like that, because there's already a due diligence period during which the buyer has the opportunity to inspect the property anyway. So we never want to create that kind of language uh, subject to viewing or contingent upon viewing. We rely on the due diligence uh, period and the paragraph that's already existing. So if you are facing a situation where the buyer does not have the opportunity or does not have the desire to see the property before writing an offer, it is critical that you pull out a hold harmless agreement, which is my next handout and the last handout of this video segment. So let's take a look at the hold harmless agreement. As you can see under the title, it says in parentheses, property site unseen, okay? The property address goes at the top and it says, I the buyer or tenant, because this is also used in rentals, of the above entitled property hereby understand, acknowledge, and agree as follows. Buyer has never personally visited the property. Despite never having visited the property, buyer desires to purchase the property. Buyer is represented in the transaction by, that's where you would put your name as the agent, an agent of TR Realty. Uh, number four, buyer is not relying on any statements or representations made by broker or agent. Uh, number five, buyer assumes full responsibility for and agrees to conduct such tests, walkthrough, inspections, and research, etc. Number six, buyer is advised to seek advice from professionals. Number seven, buyer agrees to hold broker, agent, and any other employee, officer, or other agent of broker who may be involved in the transaction harmless. That's a great way to be held, as I mentioned earlier. And paragraph number eight specifically and intentionally repeats, buyer understands the nature of this agreement is a hold harmless agreement 
and release of liability. So here at TR Realty, I have a strict policy that if you are ever going to sell or rent a property to a buyer or tenant who has not seen it, you absolutely must use this hold harmless agreement. And I want to bring your attention to the bottom section of this, of this form where you can clearly see it requires notarization. Whenever you see a notary requirement on a document, it should impart to you just how important it is to use the document and to get that document accurate, right? And as is the case with any notary section, it typically states state of Nevada, but that is only written in for convenience. In, in practicality, this could be notarized in any state whatsoever. The notary would simply cross out the word Nevada and write in the name of the state. But if you're going to use a hold harmless, which is required sight unseen, it is absolutely important that this document be notarized. I would like to thank you for watching this video. I hope it was informative for you. If you are licensed with another brokerage in Southern Nevada, and would like to talk with me, please text me or visit our website. See you next time.